Thanks very much, Sophia. Um, and I'll give people a little bit of time to come into the room just to allow a couple of um, more seconds. And uh, for those of, who are coming in, if we can just remind you to keep your cameras off and on mute, that would be great. So I'd like to begin this afternoon um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am on today at the Gold Coast. I'd like to acknowledge the Yugambeh people and in Yugambeh language, hello is Jingari, so Jingari. And uh, I'd like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and especially on the lands where each and every one of you are today across Australia. And in fact, we also have some international visitors as well. So a very big welcome to you all and thanks for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Uh, so I'm Catherine O'Sullivan. I'm going to be your moderator this afternoon. We've got a, a highly esteemed panel of experts that I would like to just introduce briefly. I'd like to begin with Dr. Richard Eden. Um, Richard is <laughs> someone's got their microphone on. I'm sorry. If we could just have microphones off, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Richard is the Executive General Manager for Education and Smart City Enterprises in the Springfield City Group. He's got an extensive career across government, program development, business development and strategy, and has been leading this whole um, education piece out at Springfield. So thanks very much, Richard, for putting this together this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to follow on by introducing some of our fabulous uh, high school principals that we have with us. So first of all, we've got Tony Reardon, who's the principal of St Aidan's Girls School, who's got a long history of working in independent schools and particularly in single sex schools. So very big welcome to you this afternoon, Tony. Uh, we have Anthony McAuliffe, who is very well known as the headmaster of Brisbane Grammar School. Interesting to note, oh, someone's got a microphone on. We could just have microphones off, thank you. Um, so Anthony's actually had 25 years at Brisbane Grammar and um, is deeply entrenched in what it is to be a single sex boys school. So we're very interested in, in his um, contribution this afternoon. And also Catherine O'Kane, who's a principal at All Hallows. Again, 30 years experience as a teacher uh, and across all, all facets of delivering in secondary education. And she's only the second lay principal who's ever led All Hallows School. Uh, a little known fact about Catherine, the both of us share an O in our surnames, but we both started life as uh, teachers at Miles. So um, there are not too many people who would have started at the same time in such a small country town in remote Queensland. Uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Terence Fitzsimmons, who is a senior lecturer in leadership with the University of Queensland Business School. He is a chartered accountant by background, but has been doing a lot of work in leadership and I found his report um, incredibly interesting. So we're looking forward to hearing from you today. Uh, we also have Dr. Judith Gill, who is a, an adjunct professor at the University of South Australia. Uh, Judith has also been a teacher before she moved into educational research, but her area of research is in fact on instigating gender effects on schooling. She's written some great books and we've sent some readings to you, two of them in particular, Beyond the Great Divide, which was um, single sex or co-education, and the second one called A Girl's Education, which was released in 2016. And I know many people quote from those books, Judith, so we feel very privileged to have you here with us. Mark Newman who's Director of Improvement Strategy for Independent Schools Queensland. Thank you very much for being with us, Mark. You've spent a long time working on this area of performance and development with schools and have a strong background yourself, of course, in teaching and administrating. And you work a lot with government, so it'll be interesting to hear your perspectives as well. And finally, Dr. Maria Palotta Kirioli, who is at Deakin University, She's also um, a, a terrifically acknowledged academic and she's written a book recently called Living and Loving in Diversity. And um, that book is going to provoke many of our thinking, when we're, many of our think, thoughts as we're speaking about single sex schooling this afternoon. So thanks very much for joining us as well, Dr. Maria. 
So let's get going with this. I'm sorry, I have a little bit of uh, technical issues there with um, people having to keep their uh, microphones off, but I'm sure you will all respond to that until it's time, of course, to ask some questions. And we'd like you to, I would encourage you to sort of get those questions up into the chat room. And during the last 20 minutes this afternoon, we'll, we'll go to answer as many of those as we, as we can. Well, interestingly, since Springfield actually put this topic out, there's been an extraordinary level of interest. So we know that the media have picked up on it. They've had interviews with Richard. This afternoon, we've got over 100 participants. But interestingly, not only locally, as I've said, I think there's probably 14 universities that are represented here this afternoon. Uh, a large number of schools, including from Hobart, South Australia, New South Wales, Victoria. So welcome to all of our interstate colleagues. Uh, but interesting, we also have the Oxford Business School on, Terry. I'm wondering if they, if you have a colleague over there who's coming on to get some insights from what we're doing in education in Australia. And there's also someone else from Oxford University. So really lovely to have such a diverse audience here this afternoon. Just goes to show that this topic of single sex schooling and the conversation that it brings up is something that is of interest to so many people across the spectrum, not only people who are actually in schools, associated with schools, teaching in schools, researching in schools, but of course, so many parents who are grappling with this question, hearing sort of um, the contested remarks about single sex schooling. So this afternoon is actually a think tank. That means we're not going to come to, uh, to any sort of a conclusion. And of course, if we were able to, uh, we probably wouldn't be having this think tank because it is a highly contested area. So what we are intending to do, though, is to hear from these great minds and perhaps have you be able to respond to some of your own impressions of the diversity of thinking that we hear today. So I'm going to get the ball rolling and I'm going to actually start with you, Anthony. I'm going to ask the question, how important do you think personalised education is for students learning in today's world? Uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to respond to that by saying that I think helping each individual student, male or female, to learn how to regulate their own learning, so learning the skills required to regulate their own learning, is probably more important than um, a personalised curriculum. So teaching, teaching students to be those self-regulated learners to be able to deconstruct complex questions and problems and then collaborate with those around them in order to use that knowledge meaningfully, I think is probably the most important skill or attribute we can give a modern student. Tony, what do you think about that? How important do you think personalised education and learning is in today's world for students? Uh, thanks, Catherine. I, I really liked what um, Anthony had to say about um, personalising the student rather than the curriculum. I have a feeling that some of us can get confused by personalised learning and think about it more in terms of customised learning or customising the curriculum rather than um, I suppose my view is uh, personalising the student and the very first thing we need to do is to know know the student, um, so know the family's uh, wants and needs for, for their um, child's education. And then of course, knowing the student right from the very beginning of enrolment, uh, what, what's their background, what are their interests, what are their strengths, and of course, what are their aspirations and their goals? So um, very important. Okay, and I think, um, as I mentioned, this whole area of you know, parental uh, connection to schools and wanting to know what's happening and whether it's single sex or whether it's co-ed and having this sort of very firm opinion about it, often picked up through the media. I guess that's led to uh, Richard, you at Springfield, really um, looking across your education delivery out there to try to determine how it can meet the growing needs of your Springfield community. Can you tell me a little bit about, because I think you're such a microcosm of so many emerging communities. Can you tell me a little bit about the context out there? Yes, certainly, Catherine, thank you. Um, and thank you for everyone that's contributing to, to this think tank. Um, we are a rapidly expanding city and we're right on Brisbane's doorstep. So we have a population of 50,000 now. 
but a third of that population is under 19. So schooling and uh, skilling and jobs and the, that pipeline for our young community is absolutely vital. Uh, we have 11 good schools at the moment. Uh, all of them are co-ed. Six of them are public, five of them are private. And we're always looking at trying to orchestrate um, the offerings for parents and to provide choice and education for all in this growing community. We do anticipate that our population of 50,000 may double and even more in the next 10 year window, which is significant growth. And if you think about uh, uh, planning for, for new schools is a long haul. Uh, they're long capital works programs, they're long investment cycles that you need to align with. And so the demographers have told us there is at least capacity in our population growth by 2026 for, for example, an all boys school and an all girls school to be added to the complement of schools that we already have. And so we just wanted to have an informed debate and, and discussion around, are there urban myths associated with um, uh, single sex schooling that don't apply anymore? Is it about heritage? Is it about um, intergenerational parental ideas? Are there changes in how parents choose these days? So that's that was our purpose for today was to sort of open up the discussion around those things. But our objective uh, is to consider what are the new schools that we need in our mosaic of of learning in Greater Springfield. Yeah, and again, I suspect it's because that demographer is actually meeting the needs of parents. And so whilst you have 11 co-ed schools at the moment, there is the conversation about, can I have my child at a single sex school? Um, and uh, for a whole range of reasons, and it, it, it could be simply that they understand their own child and their own needs. But um, Catherine O'Kane, I'm interested, do you think that personalised education can actually improve with single sex schooling? I, and I've I probably should rephrase this notion of personalised education because I think both um, Tony and Anthony were very um, explicit in their description of the fact that this is not actually having each child with their own curriculum and meeting those needs. But tell me, how does it work, uh, do you think, with a single sex school in terms of being able to create something that's more nuanced? Catherine? Okay. Thanks so much, Catherine. And I do agree with everything that Anthony and Tony said previously. One of the benefits of single sex schooling, and if I use a particular program, which I know Anthony and Tony you know, share this in their schools, if we look at a sports program in a single sex school, we only have to look at resourcing the sports that the girls play. We don't have to provide resourcing across the breadth of both girls sporting um, offerings and boys sporting offerings. But the same is true also if we look at, for example, the English uh, curriculum. When we're looking at novels to study, for example, we are able to look at what appeals to the students in our school who are all girls, um, and we can tailor curriculum to what specifically interests our, our girls, our students here at All Hallows. And when you're teaching in a co-ed school, while there can again be, you know, you offer different novels at different times, but sometimes you do have to all have the same novel or the same play. And it, that tailoring to a group of students is not as specific as it can be in a single sex school. That's not to say that one novel is going to appeal to every student in a girl's school or a boy's school. If we, you know, it's not that simple, but there are certainly real benefits in being able to tailor everything we do to our young women. It's interesting, I think, um, Catherine, because one of the claims that we often hear are, is in fact that, um, you know, perhaps single sex, sex school can stereotype genders and, and create much more of that sort of morphous effect, if you like. Um, so I'm interested in hearing from the researchers now Judith, would you like to tell me what you think about personalised education and the role it plays in single sex schooling? Mm, that's a huge question. As I'm sure <laughs> no. uh, just a few comments, though. It seems to me that um, some people argue that for girls, schooling is necessarily a more personal experience than for boys. However, 
by the same token, in schools that I have been impressed by, there's a lot of attention to principals knowing the students, knowing each and every one of them, which seems like it might be an impossible idea, but noise in the middle, is that true for everybody? Yes, if we could just remind people to turn off their microphones, thank you. You've you've inadvertently gone on to mute, Judith. Oh, I can unmute. There. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Is it okay to leave my microphone on? Then? Yes. While you're speaking, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Will do. Will do. Yes. So education as a personal experience seems to be relatively important to many young people and many teachers, and in particular, increasingly so to school principals, to feel you are someone who is known and belongs is enormously important for young people learning. Um, and there are different strategies that different schools undertake to pursue that ideal and try and make it happen. Um, but I'll be very interested in everybody's comments. Thanks very much, Judith. What about you, Maria? What have you, what have you found in this space around personalised learning? You've done quite a bit of research in, in various sectors and in various settings. Thanks, Catherine. And first of all, thank you so much for inviting me on. It's, um, it's wonderful. I guess definitely, as Anthony said, about um, personalised learning, there is a place, though, for diversifying the curriculum. I'm thinking, I'm mindful of what Richard said about the future of um, particular cohorts or populations and communities. And um, where I'm coming from in the, the communities I work with, we work with intersectionality, issues like cultural diversity, faith diversity, um, um, sexuality diversity, and now increasingly parents and families and communities are aware of gender diversity. So one of the questions we need to address then is how does gender diversity, transgender, non-binary young people, how would they be accommodated and be able to personalise their learning in, in schools? So, you know, whether they're single sex or co-ed schools, how are we providing opportunities for various communities and families in our, in our areas um, to find the education they need? And if every school comes with an inclusive curriculum, inclusive learning strategies um, and inclusive culture, then we are allowing for choice from parents and families that meets the needs of, of increasingly intersectional communities in Australia and increasingly driven by young people who are wanting much more personalised learning, but also a curriculum and a school culture that allows for um, a continuum rather than a gender binary. Mm. Yeah, great points. Thanks, Maria. So, Anthony, how, as a school principal, would you demonstrate or do you demonstrate to your parent community that you are on about diversity and inclusiveness? Well, taking from what Maria said, one of the things that's certainly a very strong um, curriculum here at Brisbane Grammar School is our student wellbeing curriculum. And mm -hmm. its focus is on healthy, healthy living and healthy relationships. So, you know, we often hear the phrase toxic masculinity um, but the reality is that working very closely with young males to understand their role in society and to understand that they have an obligation to be respectful to um, to the female gender and understand their place within society is a really important part of our education and I think as Maria alluded to you know within within this school, and I imagine within all schools, all male schools, there are different masculine constructs and being able to celebrate those different constructs and to lord them equally as some of the more traditional masculine constructs is a very important part of any modern school. Mm. Um, I think what's interesting is that uh, both single sex for girls and for boys has really come under the microscope, as I said, by, by, by the community at large. But one of the things that I know the Alliance of Girls Schools um, has been involved in is, is very much looking at 
the gateway of young women into CEO and leadership positions and, and trying to backward map, is that gender pay gap and is that gender gap around sort of leadership at, at you know, on the ASX, et cetera, is that in some way related to their schooling and their schooling experiences? And I think Terry's report um, that he's written uh, called Hands Up for Gender Equity, which is a major study into confidence and career intentions of adolescent girls and boys, is really very enlightening and, and certainly I think is um, one that we need to look at this afternoon. So, Terry, would you like to just give us a little bit of a high-level overview of what your research found? So, we were looking at um, why there are so few women CEOs in the ASX space. And in fact, it's declining, not rising at the moment, which is um, disturbing. But that kind of led us back to childhood and um, the Alliance happened to be in the audience when we launched a report into female um, CEOs. So uh, one of the comments I made is that the, to date, there's been no study um, that demonstrates that women have more confidence than men. Now, there's a difference between self-esteem and self-confidence. We were looking at self-confidence. Um, but the Alliance said uh, after that launch, look, we, we believe that the single sex girls come out with equal levels of confidence than the boys. And that's a key finding. And in fact, it's true. Um, we're across 10,000 students from the top matriculating schools in Brisbane uh, and St Aidan's and All Hallows participated in that, which was fantastic. Um, that was true. Um, you know, there were equal levels of confidence from year seven to year 12. Uh, between the boys and the girls. What was different, however, was the stereotypes or the stereotypical careers and career interests. And they mapped very closely to the makeup of Australian society, which is no surprise. Um, but I guess I think the difficult thing um, that schools face is that they're one environment, then there's parents, of course, media um, and society generally that have expectations around gender roles. Uh, and while I, and I know this is true that STEM engineering, you know, medicine, there's a great focus on getting more girls into those careers. There's a lot of pressure for those to be uh, in caring areas. So rather than heavy engineering, it tends to be around environmental engineering or, you know, in uh, STEM, it tends to be medicine rather than engineering. So um, there's a lot of work still needs to be done, uh, both parental messaging, which we found differences between what the boys were hearing and what the girls were hearing around career around education. So when we know that's happening in schools that are paying particular attention to this, it's a real worry about what's happening in schools where they're not. Uh, and it's no surprise, I just came out of a meeting at UQ where we were talking about the pipeline into PhDs, and it's exactly the same as the makeup of our industries. And, you know, we keep going back, oh, what about our undergrads? And then what about year 12? And what about, if we found a study that in year seven, they had already made up their mind about career interests. So um, we've got a lot of work to do, I think, perhaps in primary school rather than high school. Mm. And, and I think one of the things that fascinated me was that you were quite specific about three things that could underpin a young person's sense of confidence. Would you like to outline what those three are? Because I think they're just, they were extraordinary takeaways that I, I would be interested to get the principals to uh, comment on. Yeah, and it, well, I guess what, before I do that, one of the principals uh, before we got the results actually said, look, I'm looking for things that can convince parents that it's not all about the um, the year 12 exams, that, that there's way more to life than this and particularly around confidence. And it absolutely was true. What we found um, that was the biggest contributor to self-confidence was team sport. By far, it was the biggest contributor to um, confidence, that participation in team sport. Um, probably equal second and third, though very important, were the opportunity to engage in leadership development, but the actual role of leadership and sharing leadership in activities. And that usually happened, of course, in team sport, but also in the classroom. And the third thing was um, local travel. So not just excursions, but with parents going away on holidays. Um, and we know for adults, it's international travel, but what we found was, of course, if you're a parent, I've been a parent, you'd certainly don't want to take your kids overseas and let them run wild. So, but you can kind of let them do that um, during the holidays. Um, and I guess teachers don't want kids going wild on excursions either, but, but that idea of unsupervised freedom um, to, to pursue who they are as individuals with a bit of structure around it, those were the three big ones. So um, team sport, leadership development and travel. 
Yeah, thanks, Terry. Uh, and Tony, I know you're a member of the Alliance of Girls Schools. How did that study impact for you as a principal? Yeah, um, I'm going to, to put my hand up right now and disclose that um, I'm a number one fan of uh, of Terry's research. And um, I, I would I would say to um, participants today, if you haven't had an opportunity to read Terry's report, um, please do so. Uh, it's uh, a wealth of information. And as a principal, I come back to that research over and over again. And as a very proud member of the Alliance of Girls Schools Australasia, um, it's I know it's one of the um, key points of research of that association that is really helpful in being able to uh, explain um, the, the value of, of girls' ed education. So, um, yeah, very, very impactful for us here at St Aidan's. Thanks. And I'm wondering, um, Mark, given that you work in the area of school performance and improvement, can you tell me, do you think girls actually learn better in an all girls environment? I would have no view about that at all, Catherine. I, I, I do the numbers and that sort of thing. I'm not the person for this one. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, Catherine O'Kane, tell me what your impression of that question is. Do you have an answer for that? Uh, I think that, and I agree with Tony, I think that Terry's research is absolutely fabulous and certainly something that we have drawn deeply on. Um, it would be my experience definitely that the, the girls do, uh, you know, they really thrive in an all girls environment. That the, and we spoke earlier about how we can tailor the curriculum around your earlier question, Catherine, of individualised learning. But I also feel that within our community, uh, it's about the community coming together. So our school is really an opportunity also for parents to be actively involved in their daughter's education. And I do pick up on Terry's point there that the number one contributor to confidence was team sport. And that also relates back to the earlier point that I made about being able to provide a very extensive sporting program here because we only have to provide girls. We don't have to half our sporting budget across both girls and boys. Um, and, you know, we've got 1,600 students here at All Hallows, and there are less than 100 girls here who do not participate in the sporting program. It is an amazing way to develop the sisterhood. We talk about the AHS system, those bonds that exist between the girls. And so that's fostered in a number of ways through our house system, uh, but also through all of our co-curricular um, programs that we offer, Sport, Culture and Mercy Action. It is really about providing ways for the girls to thrive and to work together. We've spoken also, Judith brought up the point about uh, relational learning. The girls uh, really do thrive in a very relational environment as well. And we're able to do that in a very holistic way, which I think is one of the great strengths of, of what we do here with our young women. Thanks, Catherine. And, and Judith, can I get you to respond to that, given that you've looked at the single sex or co-educational sort of piece in your research? What, what is it telling you? You're on mute. Sorry, Judith. No, still on mute. That's better? Yes. yes. Very interested to hear about your research, Terry, and I plan to read the report very closely because it was quite shocking to me to find a whole series of studies that looked at young children. This is primary school, um, third and fourth year primary school, where the boys emerged as much more confident of their way in the world than did the girls. I found this a really scary effect of a typical Australian educational experience. And so I myself have looked a bit more closely going up and through the school. Confidence building seems to me to be very related to success. And the issue of girls and maths has been one that's troubled me as a once upon a time maths teacher, that what we need is to build more confidence in girls and hopefully that continuing disparity between enrollment choices will disappear, but it has not lasted its usefulness for a long, long time. In fact, I'm a little inclined to say sometimes that what Australian teachers as a whole are very good at, very effective in, is convincing a majority of the population they cannot do maths. 
and unfortunately too many females co-opted into that because it's somehow really more acceptable for the girls to say, oh, I can't do that hard stuff. And people think, oh, yes. And so that's where the girls' school has a real chance to come into its own. And that's why I'm going to really enjoy your report, Terry. Thank you. Um, so, Anthony, do, do you think that single-sex schools do actually do better academically? Well, in my context as uh, an all-boys school, these boy, the boys here do very well. Um, I, I think perhaps a better way of couching it, Catherine, is that often it comes down to students having a sense of belonging and the school culture which embraces those children. Um, you know, being able to and go back to your first question about personalised learning, I think it's more about personalised learning experience. And that experience involves whether it be team sports, as Terry and Catherine have alluded to, um, whether it's being part of a team in a classroom environment, whether it's wearing the same uniform and feeling as if you're part of something bigger than yourself. They're, they're the things in the end which really do motivate young people to strive to act actualize their potential and I think that um, uh, ultimately if people know that you care then the outcomes are usually better. And and Anthony do you find that it's a, a conversation to be finding opportunities to actually work with all girls schools and have the boys interacting with girls at different levels across your school? Yeah I, I think it's wonderful to have those co-educational opportunities and, and we're very fortunate where our sister school is right next door. And so we have those opportunities where the boys and the girls get an opportunity to talk primarily about social issues, but also um, about bigger issues that may be affecting the world at large. Um, and I think that, you know, recent conversations uh, through the media about the whole notion of consent, that really opens up um, opportunities for young people to talk about their fears, um, misunderstandings, misconceptions. And, you know, if done in a really structured way, we can really help people, young people in particular, understand the right way to behave in certain contexts. Uh, and I think we end up creating a better society for all of us. Yes, and so that's obviously been a live conversation for you as principal of an all-boys school in the face of some of these conversations that are going have been going on in the wider community um, and this notion that you can be stereotyping gender in a single-sex school. So, you know, you do implement programs to overcome that conversation. Absolutely, and I referred to it earlier when I talked about our student wellbeing curriculum. Mm. You know, th those notions of healthy relationships, whether it be with those of the same sex or the opposite sex, are absolutely crucial because we know that the boys are coming from different backgrounds, different attitudes, different values, and helping them to traverse that complex web of social um, dynamic is a really important part of their upbringing. Mm. And, and Maria, you know, in your research, you did, as I said, you interviewed students from a large range, I think there were 10,000 students, you interviewed across Australia from sort of rural settings, single sex set, settings to co-ed settings. What were some of, and, and this was very much focused on actually interviewing the students and getting their interpretation, what were some of the things, the sort of headline um, learnings, I guess, that we could take away from perhaps the single sex schools where you were interviewing students. Mm, thanks, Catherine. Um, it was interesting because only the other day I pulled up this book, which I thought was ancient history, but it's not. <laughs> Being normal is the only way to be, um, which Wayne Martino, the wonderful dear friend of mine, Wayne Martino and I did in 2005. And it, it goes back to this idea of, again, the intersectionality model and the fact that, you know, I'm listening to these amazing conversations of this great work happening in schools. And again, if we look at intersectionality, we need to look at socioeconomics. So is there an equity in sourcing our various schools? Which, which boys, which girls, which students are able to aspire and get to positions of leadership in um, certain careers? 
Are we providing opportunities in both single sex and co ed schools for those students who are coming from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds and diverse cultures um, to diversify their ideas of success? Yes. To do schools diversify their ideas of, um, of, of what it means to achieve? I think it's really important. Now, in terms of your question, Catherine, the, um, what we found and increasingly, uh, and sorry, are still finding is that there are gender hierarchies, and I think Anthony's spoken about this, even within a single sex school, there are certain students who are seen as the pinnacle or achieve confidence because of their cultural capital or their economic background or a whole lot of other, the, the colour of their skin came across very strongly. So I think those kinds of issues, we need to look at the hierarchy within, which means that no matter what structure our school has, single sex co-ed, are we providing an equity and equitability of what it means to be successful? what it means to gain rewards um, and what it means to cater for socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, in incredibly important. I know with Springfield and many areas that are developing, we really need to, again, take into consideration diversity, inclusion, but intersectionality. And what I'm thinking is if we're in a community of schools, how does each school perhaps focus on and provide specific awareness or catering to particular needs of particular students without a hierarchy being in place. So that was coming across in our single sex schools, very much so. Oh, oh, oh. I thought, thanks Maria. I thought that your writing about um, understanding the culture and context for students mm -hmm. and how that permeates the classroom was incredibly important. And I think all of us today on this, um, particular webinar would probably be would be still outraged is the word I would use um, in terms of Indigenous success in our education system and when I talk about that I talk about across Australia and so um, you know the statistics less than five years ago were that for every five Indigenous students who started year one um, there might be one to finish year 12 but often less than that so yeah. we do know that the system that we've been using, whether it's single sex or co-ed, has not worked. Uh, and I think, Richard, you have got an interesting model at Springfield where you are really looking at, in the same way, I guess, in terms of the philosophy around single sex, you're taking this culture and context to a new level for a group of Indigenous students out there. Would you like to tell us about what you're doing in that space? Yes, look, one of our 11 schools is an Indigenous school. Himbiyamba Independent School, and uh, it's highly successful. It's it's got a an active curriculum plan for every individual student. It's about academic success. Uh, Ninety five percent of the three hundred students are Indigenous and come from a very wide catchment um, where they are assisted in transport to get here, etc. But all eleven schools have formed a learning coalition in Springfield where the principals and I work together on things that we could do better together than any one of us could do on our own, if that makes sense. And uh, we're also trying to lower the boundaries between our 11 schools where sharing a resource is important uh, or we're celebrating or creating a festival or an inter-school sport or any of those sorts of things are important. And what we're finding uh, with Himbiyamba Independent School is it's invaluable in helping the other 10 schools embed Indigenous knowledge and education into their, the way they operate because it's such an authentic uh, inclusion. And everyone's super proud of that. And you can see in the students, uh, they acknowledge their, their contribution and their worth and their um, complementarity with each other. In, and it's really, really a good thing to watch. Yeah, and, and I think when that school was first brought up, it was I was actually working in government at the time, and it was quite a controversial model to actually embed an all Indigenous school and to have it out at Springfield. And I certainly would like to acknowledge the work of Jim Varghese in, in allowing that to happen, really pushing that forward and had many years of success working in Indigenous communities. And I think if we look at the new closing the gap report, 
um, there seems to be an acknowledgement by government that we need to actually provide education within the context and within the culture and the setting of where students are. So those 36 remote communities, which currently don't have any access to secondary education, may well actually have access um, if this new closing the gap report comes to fruition. But it will be about, um, you know, schools who are prepared to actually take their model and, and, and co-share it, if you like, with mm. some of those Indigenous communities. But I'm sure that's a webinar for another day. Um, but it is, it is a very real example of culture and context. And I think that's what these three principals here today have really done with their single sex schools is under their destination schools. They understand the culture of the parents. They understand the context of the education that they're offering. And they have a long history of heritage as well as being um, encompassing Christian values, which are predominantly the single sex schools that we see on the Australian landscape. But I think there is, because of the research, there's, there is this conversation that perhaps there are times in a young person's life, whether they're in a co-ed school or a single sex school, that it is best to learn on their own without, in terms of gender, rather than having um, actually, you know, boys and girls in the classroom perhaps competing with each other at different times, trying to overcome the deficit in STEM, for example, by creating all-girl science classes or all-girl maths classes. Um, and I think some of the research is indicating that that is, in fact, um, an appropriate way to go. And I know, again, the Alliance of Girls Schools, who are very active in this research area, have demonstrated that. Um, but I wonder if, as we start to move forward, this is, there's actually a, a name for it now called the Diamond Model, where it's perceived that by year seven, perhaps it's best to um, put students into these single-sex classes Catherine O'Kane, have you got any sort of um, opinions about when or if students should be streamed into single sex classes and, and, and does that impact at a particular age around their academic skill development? As you've touched on already, Catherine, there is a lot of research uh, that supports the idea that uh, particularly girls in single sex schools do perform better academically. Um, in terms of saying, is there a best year to start in a single sex uh, classroom for young women? Certainly our school starts at year five. Uh, I think it comes back to where we started this discussion this afternoon, which was around your question around personalised learning. And it's really that I don't think there's one answer that suits all young women or all young men, that it is the partnership that we are in with parents, that parents are always the first educator of their child and that parents would be best placed to know when is the right time for their child to start at a single sex school. Uh, certainly there's a lot of demand for year five entry and uh, as a Catholic school, a lot of the Catholic boys schools, uh, the single sex boys schools start at the year five level. And we certainly see the girls thriving here from that year, but it really is an individual choice. So year five or year seven, in terms of entering a single sex school, I think there's a lot of interesting research to be done in co-ed schools who have made the decision to have single sex classes. But that's a different topic to the webinar this afternoon. Uh, but I would be really interested to see their data as well. And it certainly does reinforce that girls do better in a single sex classroom. Mm. Yeah, what about you, Tony? Have you got anything to add to that? Um, at St Aidan's, we're kindergarten to, to year 12. So um, so we see the, the single um, education, single gender education the whole way through from early years through to year 12. Um, but I, I, look, I absolutely agree with um, Catherine O'Kane in terms of it. Um, it is really about um, working in partnership with families going back to knowing um you know knowing families i've i've um was really interested richard in hearing about um the learning coalition for springfield and i've um, um have had an opportunity once before to to hear about that from you and i absolutely 
congratulate you and the and the and the schools out at Springfield because what a what an amazing model to be able to collaborate and to to do the work um, that I'm suggesting, which is to really know your um, your families and the needs of of them in terms of um, educating their children. So, you know, we live in a in a world of um, of big data. We're um, starting to open up um, student voice. You know, finding out more from from children themselves around what they're looking for for education. So um, I, I really wouldn't put forward a, a theory or a view around a particular year of streaming. Um, it really is uh, about choice. Um, and Maria, diversity as well. And thanks very much, Tony. And so Terry, when you talked, when you looked at your research around self-confidence in young people, what age did you start to think that was really a differentiator or a differential that you wanted to look at when it started to develop or where was that line that you looked at? Yeah, so um, we were guided by research that had gone before us when, when self-confidence begins to diverge and it diverges at around the age of 10 uh, in co-ed systems. So again, that's probably backing up what we're hearing, though confidence and stereotypes are different. but. There's something around that age that there's obviously something different going on where it matters about the environment that they're in. And pre that, obviously, um, all the preceding research shows that before the age of nine or 10, um, whatever's happening in a co-ed environment is not impacting self-confidence. But after that, it certainly is. So I, I'd concur with that, perhaps that year five level. And can I throw something in from the side, which is um, uh, I've done a bit of background stuff on evolutionary psychology which is kind of way out of sight of scope here today but um, human society um, right up before civilization was divided by gender from around age nine or ten so from nine or ten the boys would go off with the men to learn to hunt and the girls would be involved in community from that age but before that age they were all together being looked after by the elders so you know maybe there's some clues there too around um not that i want to play nurture nature but it kind of all backs up this idea of around nine or ten years old there's something going on that's really important mm. and and did you see any correlation or did you evidence the correlation between self-confidence and academic success was that touched on in your study, in your research? No, it wasn't, um, though I can say, so not in that study at all. Uh, but what led us there um, was the background of the CEO. So self-confidence is critical. It's critical to success. There's no doubt about that at all. Uh, and of course, you know, all of the CEOs that we interviewed were highly self-confident. But when you look at their backgrounds, so we went back uh, and looked at 60 um, CEOs and looked at w were they single sex, were they co-ed? It was an equal mix. Um, you know, were they city country? Again, almost an equal mix. But the one thing that held them together was that they were from schools that were highly resourced, highly engaged, great teachers, parents that were involved in making decisions. And this is, you know, these CEOs go back to the 50s and 60s. But it was clear that smaller class sizes involved teachers, resourcing, uh, all of those things were what actually determined the outcome, not necessarily single sex or co-ed. Mm. Yeah, thanks. And it's it's fascinating because at the moment, obviously, single sex schools are very much in the minority compared to the vast majority of co-ed schools. So there is a, there is definitely um, an element in the community that particularly want to pursue this idea of a, a single sex education. And presumably it's about outcomes, whether it's academic success, whether it's self-confidence, there's something that they see in that piece. But we're also seeing some single sex schools now starting to move into co-ed. Mm. Judith, do you have anything in your area of research that's that's probably, you know, um, I guess giving some evidence as to why that's happening? Is it parental pressure? Uh, you know, is it community pressure? What is happening there? You're on mute. <laughs> Yeah, and goodness, I keep muting myself. I'm not usually that mute. Um, but oftentimes there are economic reasons for why schools are choosing to change from single sex to co-ed. Um, not always, and I'd hope not only because it seems to me that it's terrifically important to look at the whole range of issues, that some of which have been talked about today, 
I'm personally always made rather nervous when I hear claims of, oh, well, the research shows girls do better in girls' schools because I have to say it, but that's not a consistent response from large studies that have sufficient members in their study to be able to compensate for the different things like socioeconomic difference, like um, English speaking, et cetera, et cetera. But I won't go on there. But I wanted to say that the work of Murray Guest, who was the principal of the TAS school, the, um, the Armadale, New England, the Armadale, the yeah, Armadale school. school, a school, a long standing, uh, well respected boys' school in New England. Um, he had the fortune as principal to have an entire year off to travel around the world and interview schools in different places and to talk about different styles of schooling, etc., came back and decided to change from single-sex co-ed. And hearing his, his writing and his talking about his experience, it's just lovely because he's so clear and so honest in his assessment of what it was like and why they had to change. And yes, there was an economic imperative built in there too, but the sorts of change he's observed as an educator, I found very hopeful for the future of that school and some others that I've had dealings with. I've had quite a few dealings with schools countering change and trying to face up to what that might mean, often with people being rather fearful of what it might mean teachers, along with principals, seem to be very attached to their idea of themselves as a boys teacher or as a girls teacher, or I've always been at a girls school, this is where I belong sort of thing. And it's rather interesting to think about the sort of work that has to happen so that people can imagine different sorts of encounters and experiences as part of the educational journey that we want all young people to share in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Moment, but look at Murray Guest's work because it's just terrific. Thanks for that, Judith. Uh, Maria, did you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, I think, um, again, I keep coming back to Wayne Martino and, and my work and, and also that book that you've got that I've given, Living and Loving in Diversity, which I didn't write. I was an amazing editor as an ally to the Australian LGBTIQA plus multicultural council. And from those, we see again that, again, it's the quality of the schooling, the diversity and the, um, as Anthony said, about toxic masculinity. Um, in, in that book, you'll see many stories of young people of diverse faiths, diverse cultures, economic backgrounds, and sexualities and genders. And they keep talking about sometimes that toxicity. Some of the guys who are cisgendered males will talk about how they would have preferred a co-ed school because in a co-ed school they could have had friends who were girls and would have been able to somehow get away from some of the homophobia, uh, transphobia from other from other boys um terry uh, i have i've read some of your report and i love some of the work around confidence but again and i'm sure richard your indigenous school which i've actually i sent the um, information around some of our black rainbow our indigenous lgbt brother boys and sister girls and i'm sure that your research or the, the students in that school and many of the students that the, the contributors to our book talked about the fact that gender diversity was part of every culture before colonization, before what the Western world calls civilization, that there wasn't a gender binary. But unfortunately, with colonialism and so-called civilization, the leaders of those communities were often the first to be killed. So um, the young people I work with from diverse cultures, gender, sexuality, we talk about that. The Takata Pui. Well, someone's got their microphone on. Someone's, just someone's trying on. to drown me out. <laughs> Sounds like a school playground. <laughs> so, so, for example, in Maori culture, and I'll, I'll finish soon, Catherine. I realise I'm going on a bit, but like in in the Maori culture, um, the Takata Pui were same same sex attracted warriors, and they were upheld in their community. In um, in Native American cultures. 
the two spirited people were the leaders of their communities because they could access an Indian culture, the hijra, with a third gender. So I would recommend reading people like Benjamin Law, Paul Capsis, Faustina Ogilvy, everyone in this book, and many people of strong Catholic and Christian faith um, who talk about what has also been erased from their cultural heritages. And I know that Indigenous communities, Richard, you know, I love what Springfield is doing, this coalition where all schools can learn from each other and share resources. I think is really important. I think we've got to be careful in when we talk about cultures that we're not picking up a Western colonial way of talking about cultures. Great, thanks very much, Maria. And Mark, I feel like I have not asked you any questions after you told me you were a numbers <laughs> man and I retreated. Um, so in your role around school performance, is this notion of you know, changing the landscape uh, to have single-sex classrooms because of the evidence that single-sex can do better. Um, are you seeing that across independent schools in Queensland? Catherine, we don't collect the data at that level, so <laughs> I, I don't have numbers for you with that one. But an interesting thing or something that people might find interesting is we've heard a fair bit about heritage and heritage uh, and these schools being uh, well established for a long time. We've got 22 single sex schools in Queensland and 20% of them are special assistance schools. So they're schools for students who are disengaged from mainstream schooling. So this idea of, of single sex schooling is not only for very established traditional schools. It's something that is quite diverse in our sector as well. And that's the, it is a really interesting point, Mark, and I, I'm interested in, in um, is there evidence that the single sex uh, aspect for disengaged students actually helps them in terms of overcoming some of the barriers that they may have faced to get to that point? Yes, I, I imagine the same arguments would be those arguments that our principals have made today about being able to focus uh, on, on one particular uh, approach as compared to having to divide their time. So I imagine the same arguments would apply for these people too. Mm -hmm. Really interesting conversation because it's certainly, um, as lifelong education continues, there'll be more and more focus on on how, to, how, can, how can these um, students come back. In fact, what did I read somewhere that if you're in one of the papers that came, if you are a a boy who graduates uh, and doesn't complete university, by the age of 24, you've, uh, you've got a 4% chance that you'll be unemployed. But if you're a girl who doesn't graduate year 12, by the age of 24, there's a 21% chance that you will be unemployed. And so I think that notion of, um, you know, the labour market and how it's much more suited perhaps to boys in both the skilled area as well as the university area, you know, d starts to define this conversation about single sex and, and where the advantage can actually happen around that. I, th I thought that was a fascinating uh, statistic. So look, um, we're starting to get to the point where I think we should ask some questions from our uh, audience. So have we got some questions there in the chat room? Have I just disappeared for a minute? I have. Uh, Richard, would you mind reading out one of the first questions so that we could get that going, please? Oh, completely lost me, did you? Are you there, Richard? Can you see yes. the... Yes, yes I am. Um, uh, so, so this one's from uh, Georgia uh, and she says, do single sex schools look to make a conscious effort in ensuring a mix of male and female teachers to ensure balanced role models and influences are still available? Great question. Anthony, you're shaking your head. We'd love to hear from you. Affirming in an affirmative way, sorry. Yes. Oh, look, <laughs> yes, the answer is absolutely. Um, our view is the best person gets the job, male or female. Uh, the reality is that um, at BGS, it's about 50-50. And I do agree with Georgia. They, regardless of gender, they provide good role models and really, really represent the, um, the 
different modes of operation that we see in society. And I think it's really important to have that balance. Mm. What about you, Catherine? Okay. I would answer the same as Anthony, that it is about the best applicant for the position, that we welcome applicants from um, men and women, and we do have a wide wide balance across the whole staff and both across teaching staff and our support staff areas. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, Richard, I'm, I'm putting you in charge of the questions now, so are you glancing along for the next one? Um, I can't see too many more there. Really? So. Well, perhaps we could encourage some people now who've got some questions. They might like to put those questions forward. Pretty unique opportunity to have this sort of group here together today. Um, as I said, I don't think we'll have any conclusions about single sex, but we certainly know um, that the landscape does demand single sex schools. And I think, um, you know, the fact that Springfield's actually reaching out and looking for one of these opportunities is, is further evidence of that. And I guess that's what's great about our Australian education system is that we do have such diversity that's out there and parents can make a choice around their own individual needs for their own child which is of course the most critical thing so have we got any questions coming in richard are there any more does anyone yeah. like to put Catherine, some questions in the chat room? Comment, please yes you can i'd love you to um it, it, it's interesting that in the past few years there's been a lot of debate through the media about the roles of single sex schools and co-ed schools I think you made a point just then about choice. And what we're seeing is that parents are far more discerning. They're doing a lot more homework in order to understand what each school offers, regardless of whether they're single sex or co-ed. And they have a much better understanding of the needs of their own children. So they're able to align those needs with what each of the schools are offering. It's really interesting. The demand for single sex schooling at the moment is going through the roof. Mm. You know, I know here at Brisbane Grammar School, the demand is three and a half times our capacity. So there's, there's obviously things happening within all of these schools, whether they're represented here today or not, which really do ring a bell for parents. And you know, be they at Springfield or whether they be the traditional schools, schools in and around Brisbane, the reality is that people are clearly identifying what best meets the needs of their child and making an informed decision about where to send their child. Mm. Yeah, no, great, great comments. Tony, would you like to add to that at all? Thanks, Catherine. Um, I am just going to apologise um, in advance. It's lunchtime here and there's a whole lot of wonderful girls playing outside my office. So uh, if there is that that um, playground uh, noise, I apologise that. But at least you get a sense of my context um, uh, here. But um, look, I have um, support uh, Anthony's comments there um, in, in um, St Aidan's context. We're experiencing the same um, rapidly increasing demand um, from from parents for the education that that we deliver here and uh, also um, also recognize how how much parents are uh, invested in understanding uh, the the education that a whole range of schools deliver so uh, yeah um, uh, sorry in education yes the whole range of um, schools deliver so um, there's I all probably what I add to it is we've got uh, on the whole I think parents who are very savvy who can see through the very narrow media constructs of single um, gender schools. Uh, I think that um, you know stereotypes of, the, of our types of schools are you know we hide away our all boys or our all girls uh, in monasteries and they're never allowed you know out to um, to to interact with the uh, other other sex or um, you know um, in th that that uh, that area and I and I really do think that they're looking for that uh, sisterhood or uh, brotherhood in, in, as a safe way for their children to get to know themselves through you know the, the social development years to be in a safe place with adults they trust that they can um, 
ask the ask the questions. I think single gender schools have been for years and years um, educating young people to be critical thinkers, to be able to express themselves really creatively. And I think the the, the places that um, single gender schools offer, and I've I actually will disclose I've had nearly 20 years of my career in boys schools um, and here I am uh, a principal of a girls school so I've had I've had a wonderful uh, privilege uh, in my career to see the wonderful things in both boys and girls schools so I'm absolutely including boys schools um, in in my comments here uh, that um, yeah that there's a, a great deal of things that a great deal of things that single gender schools are doing and Sometimes, you know, we, we probably are the, uh, the easy option to blame for lots of social ills. And uh, I've, I often sort of say that, you know, perhaps it's uh, workplaces that need to have a look at uh, if, what, what they do next uh, with the, you know, the, the stage of development of um, our young people after they come out of secondary school. Uh, because I know, I'm sure that Catherine and Anthony would agree with me. I hear a lot from our old girls, who we call our past students, of um, the unconscious bias, the stereotypes that they're still experiencing in universities and uh, and workplaces. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Tony. I think for some reason people think that you know when those 17 to 18 year olds finish at, at, at school they're all socially formed and and that's it the finish of it yet you know i already talked about yeah. government statistics are up to age 24 um and that continuing wraparound support is essential and and i certainly think that that can be offered in universities as well um catherine would you like to make some final comments as well I think that you actually you started with the key point, Catherine, in this webinar this afternoon, and that is about um, what some people may term as a personalised education, but that for me, education comes back to every student being known and valued for who they are as a, as a unique and wonderful young person in our schools. I believe that single sex schooling um, has got some benefits in that area for all of the reasons that we have discussed that I think that parents are looking more and more to be um, part of communities. And uh, when I look at the Springfield model, uh, there's a wonderful model there that Springfield has brought to life of opportunities for parents to be involved in their children's education. And that's certainly a key feature of our school and I know of Tony and Anthony's schools also. And I'm not saying that single sex schools do that better or worse than co-ed schools. That's very much a school culture question. And I think that parents are always the ones who know best what is best for their, their child themselves, um, but that it is the ability of single sex schools to offer a more tailored program to either girl, to the girls or the boys. Um, and we've spoken a lot about that this afternoon, but it all comes back to every student being known and valued for themselves, regardless of the choice that a parent makes. I've not met a parent who didn't want that for their child across my 35 years in education. And it really is at the heart of great schools everywhere. Mm, yes, yeah, thank you, terrific. Um, what about Judith? What would you, have you got some comments you'd like to wrap up with? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute, sorry, Judith. No, we speak about choice as though this is a good thing. We all agree it's good to have choice. Actually, choice, in my view, does become a burden for parents. It's very hard to make a choice that is an informed choice about schools because from the outside, schools are quite mysterious places and it's hard to find out what it's like from inside, which, of course, is what parents wish to do. And so we end up with, how did you find out? How did you find out about such and such a school? And it's often parental choice, in my experience, is very much governed by the parents' own experience of schooling. And if they went to a single-sex school and they enjoyed it, they want the same for their child. However, if they didn't enjoy it, they seem oriented to the difference from what they had in the hope that it will be different and that it will be more successful. And so 
there's one English commentator who makes a point of saying, like my other friends, we all drive past about three perfectly good schools to get to the fourth one because we have to not just make a choice, we have to be seen to make a choice. It's the burden of choice that's driving us wild. On the other hand, I was asked to come to a group of case KPMG employees who were doing a women's section. The women wanted help with choosing a school for their children. They were a young group. They were 30s, maybe early 40s, and they were desperately concerned. So how do you know to make the right choice? For me, it was a very different experience because they all came up with their Excel sheets. They were all prepared to list everything in the boxes. Which boxes do we have to get ticked? Do we have to know how many in the class, how many in the school, whatever, whatever. And for me, there was a dawning light. This is the trouble about the single sex co-ed question. It's the easiest thing to find out about a school. Is it single sex or co-ed? And then a whole lot of things flow that are often biased in terms of people's perceptions, their own experiences, or whatever, whatever. I really applaud schools working hard at open days, at making it more evident goes on in the black box of schooling and the even black box of classes so that people can make um, informed choice. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Now, Richard, there's not a question there that we need to answer, is there? Uh, there, there are some more coming through. Uh, here is one I'll relay to you. Would particular subjects or content be better understood and discussed in co-ed environments? For example, consent education. Do schools see benefits for opportunistically engaging with schools of other genders? Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine. Couldn't no, I was going to say go, Anthony. <laughs> no, I, I, I do. I, I think there are subjects that probably lend themselves better to co-ed environments. Um, you know, I think it goes back to a point that Judith made earlier, that sometimes there is an economic imperative as well. Um, I often have conversations with other school principals about what subjects may be um, better in a co-ed environment. And then similarly, principals will say things to me like, well, do you think there are subjects that are better serve, serve the needs of boys and girls if they were differentiated? So there's, there's not one particular answer to this, but my personal view is that conversations around consent certainly be um, much better facilitated if they were in a co-ed environment. And then that comes back to each of the schools to make that happen, regardless of whether they are single sex or co-educational. Could I add, um, sorry to interrupt again. But, no, great, Terry. Uh, I, I participated in Sydney, the Presbyterian Ladies College got together with the local boys' schools on that issue of consent. And can I say it was the most sophisticated discussion I have heard. Uh, it blew me away. They were year 11 and 12, but um, boy, it was, it, you, you couldn't have asked for more from, you know, 35 highly educated 35 year olds. You know, it was just amazing. And uh, it was great to see. And that the, um, obviously deep um, thinking around the issue. And what was really, I thought was amazing was their ability to share. Perhaps adults or perhaps people say 35 may not have shared as much, but they felt that they could have this discussion, uh, this equal discussion, it was just fantastic. So I, I totally agree with Anthony that um, those kinds of opportunities uh, are fantastic and we should let we should let them happen because more often than not, they've got the answers. You know, we can facilitate um, the discussion, but they've got the answers themselves. Mm. Yeah, great to hear that. Yes, Richard, is there another one? There's a question here which is particularly relevant for the last 18 months about remote learning or homeschooling. Uh, is there any research yet around the impact of, of remote learning on boys um, versus girls? Tony, do you want to start with that one? I, um, a, a quick answer from me. I'm not aware of any re research yet that uh, is, um, is is really focusing on uh, difference between um, girls or boys schools or or co-ed schools. There's um, there's definitely um, a lot of research coming out in terms of um, um, mental health and well-being. Um, I think we're yet to see the impact it's had on on uh, learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. Have you got any comments on that, Catherine or Kane? 
Yeah, I agree with Tony. I don't. I have not seen any research that is specifically about co-ed or single sex schooling. I think there's a body of research about different experiences of students in different schools. A lot of that, particularly last year, was to do with access to technology. This year, the conversation has been more about uh, the more sophisticated developments in pedagogy for online learning, but I've not seen any research that's divided by co-ed single sex in this mm. area. Mm. What about you, Anthony? Uh, Catherine, we've been tracking student feedback on this since last year. And the boys are overwhelmingly telling us that the face-to-face -face experience is far more advantageous for them. That it is, you know, learning is social, and for them, it's not always about the content; it's learning about the process. And what they get is an understanding of different processes to to arrive at the same outcome. Uh, and that happens best in situ, in, in a classroom situation. Um, I agree with Tony and Catherine that um, the, the well-being of our young people and our teachers, by the way, um, mm. all of that time in front of a screen can have a detrimental effect. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I, I look, I think it does refer back also to that, um, to Terry's research about the importance of um, being in teams and how that can increase your self-confidence. It worries me so much that our students, when they're in remote learning situations, aren't able to participate in team sport and have that piece that, that is very much a contributor to an ongoing self-development for children and young people. So, so that, you know, that's going to be a standout one that I think will probably, not so much in Queensland, but certainly interstate where there's been sustained periods of absence from schools. Uh, Maria, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. I just want to add to that. Maybe it's because, as you said, Catherine, um, that we are in a in Victoria. We've had, we've had to experience quite a few lockdowns, and um, the only we're just beginning to do the research, Tony. And um, and it seems to be that those students who were experiencing bullying or feeling like they're not part of a school, they're the students who seem to have actually almost breathed a sigh of relief. I can be at home. I can be safe. I can learn. So I'm not saying that's a positive thing necessarily because, again, it comes back to what's happening in our schools where some students are actually thinking, I'm at home, I'm safe, I can learn without the environment of the school. But that is what, and that's coming out, that's coming out across genders actually with girls and boys saying, I feel better being by myself because I'm not experiencing all that stuff. Interesting. Richard, are there any more questions there you'd like to highlight? Yes, there, there was one which, you know, it probably isn't an answer to, um, but Anthony, Anthony, you said you're about three and a half times capacity and demand increasing. Um, what are your plans to address that sort of demand? Uh, strategically, you know, these are conversations obviously I'm having with our board, is that whether in the future you're looking for partnerships with other schools, whether you're looking to develop your own junior school, whether there's a brown site out there which is struggling and you may be able to lend um, your expertise to that organisation, um, sharing staff and sharing your educational philosophies. So there are strategic opportunities um, and they obviously require a fair bit of thought and planning. So doing the feasibility, feasibility behind all of that is a 12-month project. And then as Richard alluded to at the beginning of this presentation when talking about Springfield, you know, you've got a 10-year outlook. It's, it's, sort of, it's 10 years in and then it's 10 years beyond to make sure that um, that educational facility not only opens but then continues to grow and flourish. Didn't hear him mention a campus at Springfield yet, though. It's <laughs> a ten-year journey, Catherine. You heard that. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a. I'm very interested in um, how parents make decisions, and so we might ask whether there's any research on that. But we actually have a question, well, a perspective from a parent who's put a comment in that said uh, they were in mixed. Um, until age 10 and then chose their sons to go into a um, single sex school and they chose it by the professionalism of the young men 
he showed them around and the values of the school and the school philosophy and it wasn't about gender. Mm. Yep, good comments. The wealth of wealth of choice, as Judith has said. Um, so we'll finish off with some of those remarks. Terry, did you have anything that you would like to um, sort of finish up making some comments? Yeah, I, I think what I, I'm kind of in the middle because I went to a co-ed school. Um, we were an experimental school in New South Wales um, and we topped the state and um, we weren't selective. We just topped the state because I think and what I'm hearing is it was we had a spirit we had no uniform we were we had lectures and tutorials rather than lessons it was really weird and this is the 80s so but what it created was some of the things I'm hearing today we had a spirit in the school we were different we were collective um, it wasn't about gender but it was about leadership um, we had a, a passionate principal who attracted passionate teachers who were really on board with this new idea uh, engaged us it was highly inclusive there was no gender segregation by we all did cooking and we all did agriculture. You know, we all drove the tractor uh, and, and uh, shore the sheep. And this is a city school, by the way. Uh, and we all cooked and we sewed. So I'm just somewhere in the middle, I think, lies the answer. I think there is absolute benefit in the single sex classroom. And there's absolute benefit in having um, strong partnerships with, with the other single sex schools and engaging on those levels. And I think the answer, like many things, lies in between. Uh, and I think we've still got a fair bit of research and uh, learning to do about where that where that may lie. Mm. We certainly look forward to that. Uh, Maria, have you did you have any closing comments at all? Yeah, apart from thanking everyone and thanking all the parents and everybody and teachers out there who come in today, um, I really just a, just a couple of things. I think the, um, I know it's the buzzwords, but they're very important: diversity, intersectionality specificity for example single sex classes within an inclusive poet framework are important i really commend the principles that come on from girls schools around what happens after the girls leave school this is a huge issue of workplaces this is a systemic and structural social issue that a lot of our young people especially young women are going into including when they leave university um, and the other thing i would say is again then that the importance of critical literacy um, critiquing the societies and the cultures and that we are in, the media representations. I think we need to ask students that. And finally, we're talking about parents and parents are incredibly valuable and I love parent engagement, but we need to go back and ask the students because some of us work with students whose parents have a particular view of themselves as a young woman or a young man, which may not fit the model what's required in Australia. And I'm talking about without stereotyping or migrants, we need to look at those concerns and the diversity of staff. Absolutely, LGBT staff, all staff from all cultures and faiths. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Maria. Mark, did you have any closing remarks at all? I've only to say, Catherine, that uh, state level trends obviously don't tell you the story of individual schools, but people might or might not be interested to know that over the last 10 years at a state level enrolments in single sex schooling have remained very consistent of uh, things like um, over the last 10 years uh, uh, female only school enrolments have decreased by 41 students whereas uh, in enrolments at boys schools have increased by 743 students over the last 10 years so very consistent there hasn't been um, huge increases at a state level, huge decreases. There's been a small drop in uh, market share, only 2% for female only schools and 3% uh, for male only schools. But so again, they're holding their own. It's been very consistent over the last 10 years. And so some people might think that that's a surprise or not, but I just thought some accurate data might be helpful. Yeah, great. Really interesting. Thanks. Thanks for that, Mark. Richard, have you got some concluding comments you'd like to make? Oh, yes, certainly. Look, thank you, everyone, for uh, for participating and giving your your expertise. Um, it's allowed us to think a bit deeply about this issue, and you know, I have a personal concern. I'm not sure that the general public can think deeply about topics 
um, as easily as, as they once might have. Um, they tend to polarise into a very simple public versus private, co-ed versus single, and I think we've demonstrated in the last hour and a half. It's a very nuanced and complicated area, um, but uh, we see ourselves in Springfield as a learning city uh, where learning is valued and championed and if anybody wants to continue the discussion uh, or, or become part of that vision, then um, please make contact with us. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Richard. And I just want to say a really big thank you to each and every one of you. It's extraordinary, first of all, that Springfield was actually prepared to put this on, but it also demonstrates that we know that we've learned so much through the pandemic using technology. It demonstrates that you can take an hour out of your day, have a very fulsome professional dialogue with such a panel of experts. It's quite incredible. I mean, normally we'd be, you know, having to pay for a professional development day and travel there and back and all that sort of thing. So, so this learning from each other, I think, is going to be a wonderful way for schools to continue to flourish and connect with each other. And you know, we've acknowledged the Springfield learning model where you've got schools from different systems working together on behalf of a group of parents who've nominated to live in that city. It's a wonderful example, and it's I think it's probably one of the only ones in Australia where you can actually build a city from the ground up and then construct everything that moves into that. But there are learnings that we can take from that. And I know as educators, you are constantly learning from each other. You are constantly talking together. You model, you role model all of the values that you try to instill in your young people. You have got a great sense of community. You respect each other so much and you respect the work that you do. So thank you for all of that. And thank you for participating today. And I hope all the participants have, have enjoyed that. And, and we might look forward to, you know, a follow up one in the near future. So thanks very much again. Take care and bye for now.